Hello, my name is Turaj Deri. I am the director of the Jordan Center for Persian Studies and a professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, the tormented, you might say, history of Iran-U.S. relations. This is particularly, I think, important right now as there have been a breakthrough in negotiations between Iran, U.S., and Western powers over Iran's nuclear uh, rights. What we hear about Iran and the U.S. today in the news is really related to the relations that they've had in the past 35 or 36 years. And this is because uh, of the hostage crisis that took place in the late 70s. And since then, uh, Iran-U.S. relations have soured. Of course, this was not always so. So I want to backtrack a little bit and see uh, how things were before this time and see if there's a possibility of, again, a rapprochement and actually getting closer. Uh, it's interesting that in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, the British and the Russians were the two major powers in the world. And they had, of course, tried to dominate uh, Asia. Many of the countries in Asia, such as India, was colonized outright by the British, or Russians would take over the Caucasus to basically extract good and uh, have cheap labor. Iran was never really, or Persia as it was known then, was never colonized outright, but was under the influence of these powers. And it always tried to play one against another and try to keep its independence. Now, America, uh, which in the late 19th, early 20th century did not really have any imperialistic aspirations, was seen by the Iranians as this great um, beacon of hope from the West. And in fact, if we look at the involvement of Americans uh, in Iran, uh, it is really a very nice and brilliant, I think, CV, or you might say resume, uh, in terms of American contribution to Iran. I could just mention a couple of people. Uh, I may start with, let's say, um, Samuel Jordan, because uh, the Center for Persian Studies at UCI is named after him. He was a Presbyterian missionary who came to Iran in the early 20th century. And by 1925, he had established the American College. And many of the important Iranian intelligentsia, statesmen and architects, artists, they came from uh, the school that Jordan established. This is the uh, American College, which was later on renamed as the Albors High School. Uh, that is an important contribution, perhaps he's one of the most important people in Iran's educational history. Uh, I could mention Morgan Schuster, who in 1911, uh, after the Iran's constitutional revolution, came and was actually hired by the Iranian government to take care of Iran's finances as a treasurer because they were trustful of the Americans but not the British or the Russians, who, of course, had uh, more interesting, I guess, aspirations. Uh, I could mention an art historian, Arthur Pope, who we have actually his set of books here, The Survey of Persian Art, in this library as well. Uh, he is responsible for documenting every aspect of Iran's or Persia's artistic tradition from remote antiquity all the way uh, to the present. So he was quite influential in promoting Persian or Iranian art. Uh, you have Samuel Jordan who's promoting Iran's education. You have Simon Schuster who is taking care of Iran's uh, finances. So all in all, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, Americans and the idea of America really resonated uh, with the Iranians. I think things changed uh, after World War II and when the Cold War came into being, where uh, you might say America uh, took on this bipolar view of the world. Either you belong to the quote-unquote free world or to the communist world. What happens is, of course, Iran tried to continue that independent role in this world, not to be influenced by either side, but try to keep its independence. 
unfortunately, in 1953, the democratically elected government of Iran and its prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, who had nationalized Iran's oil, uh, he basically made so that the British would not be receiving the lion's share of the sale and holding on to Iranian oil. That was what was at dispute. Uh, what happens is the uh, U.S., because of this Cold War, sided with uh, the British and, in fact, staged a coup. This is the first successful CIA operation in the world in 1953, Operation Ajax. And then the same thing will happen in Guatemala in 1954 with our bands. You have in Chile in 1973. So this is the beginning of that, you might say, more imperialistic outlook of the U.S. and trying to control, of course, the other side, the communists, uh, who are trying to also influence other countries. And from the 1950s, what we have is a government in Iran, which is, of course, the monarchy of the Pahlavi regime, which is quite modernist. It wants to, it's secular, and of course it wants the country to go forward, but at the same time it's quite autocratic and is really dependent on the U.S. and the West. From then on, the perception of the Iranians was that, okay, so a government that actually staged a coup, removed a uh, democratically elected secular um, prime minister and his cabinet uh, may not be that friendly after all, or something has changed. And so views of the U.S. began to change in Iran in the second half. This was exasperated by uh, more closer ties between the Shah and, let's say, President Nixon, who we have the Nixon Library very close to us. We can see the uh, letters and some of the gifts that the Shah gave Nixon. They were quite close. And this dependence and interdependence. Iran was the biggest buyer of American arms, uh, amongst many other things. And when in time, uh, when there was resistance to the Pahlavi regime, the secular, the intelligentsia, and the religious, and the clergy uh, got together. And at that time, Shah was identified basically as an American puppet, you might say. That was what was called out in um, political rallies. Uh, by 1978-79, when the Shah of Iran left, uh, it was clear uh, that things were going to be changed. And what happened is, was the Iranian Revolution. By 1979, uh, you had this great, or the last great revolution of the 20th century. And the people who came to power initially tried to mediate between the relations with America's past and what they will be getting in the future. Unfortunately, some of the students, I think, uh, radical students uh, st stormed the uh, embassy, the American embassy, and then the relations between U.S. and Iran soured. And it's been an adversarial situation, especially in the Middle East, where each is trying to undo or outdo the other one. And relations have been quite bad, but there's never been an outright war. Now what is happening today in the Middle East where we're basically seeing the melting down of basic institutions and governments throughout the Middle East and North Africa, from Libya all the way to Afghanistan. There are only a few countries that are still strong and can actually bring perhaps some stability. Uh, this is Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Iran as the major powers. And what has happened, is, especially in regards to Syria, I think uh, the Obama administration saw that its interest actually is aligned with Iran's interest at that moment. And Iran could, in fact, be helpful in stabilizing uh, the situation in the Middle East. They're both against the uh, um, ISIS or Islamic State. They're against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, if this is their priority, at least on the American side in the region, and Iranians certainly are also uh, against these movements, uh, they perhaps can work with each other. And the other issue, of course, is the nuclear issue, which Iran, uh, from the Pahlavi period, tried to develop nuclear technology. And even at Shah's time, uh, Europeans and the U.S. were quite, uh, you might say, skeptical and did not very much help. And Iran was one of the earliest uh, countries to sign the IAEA agreement, 
uh, that is to promise not to uh, develop nuclear technology for uh, making a bomb or militaristic uh, reasons. However, uh, the Iranian government hadn't disclosed all of the nuclear sites that it had, and so that raised suspicions. And hence, there were these intense negotiations back and forth and back and forth. And just this past month, finally, an early, at least preliminary agreement took place between Iran, the European powers, and the United States. And I think above all, what was important was not just this preliminary negotiations, but the handshake between the Secretary of State on one side uh, of the United States, John Kerry, and their other side, uh, Javad Azari from the Iranian side. And that was a huge symbolic, I think, message that these two uh, countries, these governments who have been at odds and have had a tormented history in the 20th century, can again uh, approach each other and with mutual respect go on and try to actually make a better world, to make uh, the Middle East perhaps a little bit more stable and become a little bit friendlier. And I think that is uh, an advantage for both country and certainly for America and especially the Iranians who are under sanctions and hardships in Iran uh, because of the political situation. Uh, if you're interested about the history of Iran, Persian culture, uh, you could uh, visit uh, the Jordan Center for Persian Studies website where we have lots of programs, activities, research uh, areas uh, that may pique your interest. Thank you.